When I get asked by people, J. John, what do you do? It's very difficult to know what to say. Because if I say to them that I'm a reverend, which I am, that conjures up images in people's minds as to what I might be like. So I like to be a little bit creative in telling people what I do. And I sat next to this lady on an aeroplane in London, and I said, hello. And she said, oh, hello. I said, where are you going? So she told me. Then she said, where are you going? So I told her. I said, what do you do? So she told me. And then she said, what do you do? And I said, well, <laughs> I work for a global enterprise. She said, do you? I said, yes, I do. I said, we've got outlets in nearly every country of the world. She said, have you? I said, yes, we have. I said, we've got hospitals and hospices and homeless shelters. I said, we have feeding programs. We've got orphanages. We've got, we've got um, marriage work. We do educational work. We do justice work. We do reconciliation work. I said, basically, we look after people from birth to death, and we deal in the area of behavioral alteration. <laughs> She went, wow! Her wow was so loud, everyone turned around and looked at us on the aeroplane. She says, what's it called? I said, it's called the church. Have you heard of it? So, ladies, welcome to church. Now, God created man before woman because you always make a rough draft before the final masterpiece. A mother said to her daughter after church on the way home, what did you learn at Sunday school? The little girl said, mummy, we learned all about how God made man and woman. So the mother said, well, how did God do it? She says, well, this is what happened. God, he bent down and he got some mud and then he made the man and then he put the man to sleep and then he got his brains out and made a woman. <laughs> well, that's one version. <laughs> Let me give you the other version. Eve was not made out of Adam's head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be his equal. Yeah. Under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be loved. Yeah. Yeah. That's the correct one. Now, look. I have to confess that we men are sometimes stupid. We, we are, I'm confessing it. You see, that's why Pastor Leslie has got a man speaking today to confess that. I'm confessing it. We're sometimes stupid. This, this woman said to her husband, she said, um, darling, I had a dream about my birthday. And in the dream, I dreamt about earrings, a bracelet, and a necklace. <laughs> what do you think that means? <laughs> and he said, just wait till your birthday. <laughs> and then on her birthday, he gave her a package, she opened it, and it was a book, How to Interpret Dreams. <laughs> We don't get it sometimes. <laughs> Children get colds, men get flu, and women just get on with it. <laughs> Why does it take one million sperm to fertilize one egg? 
because men will never ask for directions. <laughs> Now, how do you keep your wife happy? How do you keep your wife happy? Well, you listen to her, you compliment her, you support her, you soothe her, you listen to her, you console her, you hug her, you protect her, you listen to her, you, <laughs> you trust her, you defend her, you clothe her, you, you listen to her. <laughs> You spoil her, you embrace her, you respect her, you listen to her. Now, 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 how do you keep your husband happy? Take your clothes off. It's just, it's hard work for a man. You know, we're doing our best, we're trying. You may be wondering, why did Pastor Leslie invite a man to speak? Listen, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through anything. <laughs> now, look, during, during a conference like this, a gathering like this, God does a number of things. One thing he'll do is this. He's going to remind us of things we already know, but we've forgotten. So you're going to hear quite a lot in the today, tomorrow, and you're going to go, well, I knew that, but it was good to be reminded. Yeah. Two, the Lord is going to reinforce things that you already know, but he wants to ink them in. And thirdly, the Lord wants to reveal something new to you. So Lord, I pray, I pray that for our time together, today and tomorrow, that you will indeed do that. You will remind us of things that we know, but maybe we've forgotten. That you will reinforce things that we need to know and ink them in. And we pray that you will reveal something new to each of us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, back to the woman on the aeroplane. After I said to her that thing about the church, we began to talk. And it became very obvious in just a few minutes that her understanding of Christianity was a misunderstanding. And that's why it's very important to know what we believe and why we believe it. And to really understand what, what does God say about us? What does he say? Now, uh, Pastor Leslie made some beautiful declarations just a few minutes ago. I'm going to pick up on some of those declarations. I'm going to tell you about four things that God says about each one of us, each one of you. The first thing he says is, you are lovable. Now, can you repeat this? I am lovable. You are indeed. The Bible says this, that this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Have you heard this? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Has there ever been a greater untruth sung in the playground. <laughs> that is not a nursery rhyme, that is a nursery crime. <laughs> and we need to reject what has been spoken over us and hear what God speaks over us, what he speaks over us. There was a, a, a little girl asleep in bed one night and during the night, there was lightning and thunder. The mother woke up and she was very concerned about her little girl. So she thought, I'll just go and see if she's all right. So she goes into her bedroom, opens the door, and the little girl is sitting by the windowsill, looking out of the window. The mother says, what are you doing? It's the middle of the night with all this lightning and thunder. You're looking out of the window. The little girl says, Mummy, I think God's trying to take my photo. 
Do you know something? Sometimes children get it. And sometimes we adults just don't get it. There's a lovely story when Jesus is asked by a desperate man, would he go and visit his sick daughter? And he said, well, of course I'll come and visit your sick daughter. So Jesus is walking, he's with his disciples, he's going through this narrow lane street, and people are hearing, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's pretty congested, it's pretty crowded. And then all of a sudden, Jesus stops, and he says, who touched me? I mean, can you imagine, you know, you're you're walking with a friend into a stadium, thousands of people are pouring in, and then your friend says, who touched me? (laughs) You're like, I wouldn't worry about it. (laughs) Do you know, chill out. There's always gonna be a bit of an elbow. I mean, even here tonight, there could have been a little bit of an elbow. Jesus said, who touched me? And you know, the disciples, oh Lord. I mean, it's not, a, isn't it? I mean, it's not as if you've got a wallet and you're gonna lose it. I mean, chill out, Lord. Jesus said, who touched me? This woman came out of the crowd and she says, I touched you. And he said to her, why did you touch me? Now, I I think Jesus knew the answer, but he just wanted her to articulate it. And she she had a woman's problem, and no one could help her. And she says, I heard about you, Jesus, and I thought if I could reach and touch the hem, the hem of your garment, not even touch your skin, just touch the hem of your garment, something would happen. Jesus said, did it happen? I think Jesus knew the answer, but he wanted her to articulate it. Oh, yes! Now, this is the great thing about that story. The crowd was following Jesus, but Jesus stopped the whole crowd for one woman. So even here tonight, you may feel, wow, there's 2,000 women here. Does he know? He knows. He knows. He knows. And all you do is reach out, he'll stop for you. Why? Because you are lovable. So repeat, I am lovable. I am lovable. Secondly, you are are valuable. Now say, I am valuable. Listen to what Jesus said. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but God feeds them. Are you not more valuable to him than these birds? Listen to the birds. Jesus said. Look at the birds. Are you not more valuable than they are? And Jesus says, of course you are. You are far more valuable than those birds are. Far more valuable. I've got in my pocket a $50 bill. It's a brand new one. It's nice when they're brand new, isn't it? I like them, they're really nice. And it's crisp, and it's clean, and it's worth $50. Now, I know this was all beautifully cleaned, but of course, many of us have walked up here with shoes from the outside, so maybe it's a bit dusty. Yeah, I think I can see a little bit of dust there. Right, let's put some dust on this $50 note. Is this illegal? Because in England, it's illegal to step on the Queen. (laughs) All right, let's put a bit of dust, bit of dust. All right, okay, there we are, right. A moment ago, this was a clean, crisp $50 bill, and it was worth $50. I can see that I've got dirt all over it, but it hasn't lost its value. It's still worth $50. 
but it's crisp. It's a crisp $50 bill. Okay, I'm going to scrunch it up now. Okay, now I've got a scrunched up $50 bill. A moment ago, it was clean and crisp, but it was worth $50. Then it got dirt on it, it never lost its value. Now it's all scrunched up and it hasn't lost its value. Listen, it doesn't matter how dirty, how scrunched up you think you are, you have never lost your value in God's eyes. There's a lady here called Sarah. And God is saying to you, you are valuable. I'm going to leave this $50 bill for you here. And at the end of the meeting, you come and take that because God is saying to you, you are valuable and you don't believe it. And God is saying you are valuable. I am lovable. I am valuable. Thirdly, you are forgivable. Now say, I am forgivable. I am forgivable. Yes, the Bible says this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The psalmist wrote, God, he forgives our sins. He has removed our sins as far as from us as the East is from the West. There was a woman who had lots of problems and she went to see a psychotherapist and the psychotherapist tried to work out when did this woman's problems all begin and he journeyed through her life eventually to a time when she was quite young and she was at school. And for some reason, her teacher took a great dislike to her. And the teacher said to her, come out here and write on the board, I am a failure. And then the teacher said to the rest of the class, I want you all one by one to come out here and write what you think of her. And the psychotherapist said, well, how did you feel when that was happening? She said, well, I, 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 I couldn't look at anybody and, and, and I started to cry and, and all I wanted to do was to die. And the psychotherapist says, as a Christian, I know that something else happened that day and I'm so sorry you were not aware of it. But when everybody else had finished writing on that board, there was a man at the back called Jesus. He got up from his desk, he walked to the front, he picked up an eraser, he erased everything that was written on that blackboard. And he wrote, I love you and forgive you. You see, maybe some of that stuff on the board was true. Maybe some of it was true. But whether it was true, whether it wasn't true, Jesus wants to wipe it clean. Jesus did not come into this world to rub it in, but he came to rub it out. You are lovable, you are valuable, and you are forgivable. Jesus wants to cleanse us from the past. You and I cannot alter the past, but we can bring the past to the altar of God. I'm from London. I was walking around London, there was this gigantic poster of a woman advertising lingerie. But obviously she was also advertising various other parts of her anatomy. <laughs> and someone wrote across the poster in large letters, S-I-N, sin. And somebody wrote underneath, what is sin? And I could see that loads of people had written definitions all over the poster. So I went to read them. 
So I went and I started reading them. It looked really funny because the post was huge. I don't know how people wrote them up there. And I'm like here, I'm kind of got my head just well, in, a, in an in inappropriate place. <laughs> you know, just say it was inappropriate. And I'm reading, I'm reading what everybody has written. And I disagree with everything people have written. So I get my pen out and I wrote this. Whoever knows what is right to do, but fails to do it, for that person, it is sin. And then I signed it, James. <laughs> and the reason I signed it, James, is because I didn't want to get the credit for it, because James and the Bible wrote that. Whoever knows what is right to do, but fails to do it, for that person it is sin. Look, even by our own standards we fail, let alone God's standards. Yeah? And, and the great news is, the great news is, is that this Jesus has done something for each one of us. There was a famous artist, and this famous artist went back to the very small rural community where he was born and brought up. And he's walking around some of the stores. There's an antique shop. He looks in the window. He cannot believe what he sees. In the window, he sees one of his masterpieces. It was a painting that he painted years before he was famous, but it was his. The frame was broken. The picture was scratched and dirty. He couldn't go into the store and say, that's my painting, give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, restore it, reframe it. That is what Jesus did for us. So look, it doesn't matter how dirty, how creased, it doesn't matter where you've been, you can't alter the past, bring the entire past to the altar of Jesus. And he is going to clean it, he's going to restore it, and he will reframe you. That is what he's going to do. One, I am lovable. Two, I am valuable. Three, I am forgivable. And four, you are capable. Now say, I am capable. You are absolutely capable. There was an ice factory that caught fire. And this ice factory that produced ice caught fire. And they had to call the fire people to come and put the fire out, even though the, the factory had all the H2O it needed to put the fire out. But the problem was all its assets were frozen. <laughs> now, when I was... I was growing up in London, I was an agnostic. I didn't believe in God, I wasn't interested in God, I didn't know anything really. But when I was a student, I met a Christian. And over a period of a year, this Christian helped introduce me to Jesus. And then one day, he showed me, in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, Chapter 3, verse 20. There's this beautiful picture of Jesus standing outside of a door of a house, knocking. And it says this, if you hear the knock, open the door and let him in. And my friend read this to me and he said to me, have you heard Jesus knocking? I said, I think so. He said, have you opened the door? I said, where's the door? <laughs> he said, don't worry about where the door is. Ask Jesus to break the door down. <laughs> On the 9th of February, 1975, I, I remember kneeling down, first time I ever knelt, 
was aware of kneeling. First time I ever prayed. And I said, Jesus, if you are knocking on my door, could you break that door down and come into my life? And as I said that, the light came on. The light came on. My heart, something happened. I could feel it in my heart. Something happened. Something shifted. I didn't have the vocabulary to explain what had happened, but I knew that the light had come on. I knew that, that something happened in my heart. My mother said to me, you're brainwashed. I said, mother, my brain has been washed. <laughs> if you only knew what was in my brain, you'd be pleased it got washed. And Jesus came into my life and Jesus came into my house. That is such a beautiful, helpful analogy for us. We, we invite Jesus to come in, not to be our landlord, but to be our Lord. Not just to be resident, but to be president. Yeah, it's very easy to say, oh, come in, come in. And then you open this cupboard, get in there. <laughs> Did that resonate? Did that resonate? I want you in my life, but, but restricted. I want you in my life, but only you can hang out there. No. The Bible says when he comes into our lives, he comes into our lives by his Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, do not quench the Holy Spirit, do not resist the Holy Spirit. Three, do not. Don't, don't resist him. Don't, don't quench him. Don't grieve him. So what we need to do is to say, come on down to the basement of our lives. Clear out all the cobwebs. Come into the attic of our lives. Clear out all the, all the bats. Come into the sitting room of our lives. Come into the, the dining room of our lives. Come into the kitchen of our lives. Come into the bedroom of our lives. Come into this room of our life. Come into that. It, it's all yours. Jesus, I want you to be resident and president. Reign and rule in my life. Reign and rule in my heart. Reign and rule in my mind. Do you know, as we do that, his spirit living in us, this is the incredible thing. His spirit living in us is the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Wow, wait a minute, wait a minute. The same? Yeah, the same in here? The same, yes, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the, from the dead lives in us. Now, if the Holy Spirit lives in us, oh my word, and it can raise Jesus from the dead, uh, wow, there's a lot in here. Yeah, therefore, I am capable. Therefore, you are capable. Therefore, everything is possible. Everything. If you've got God's Holy Spirit, everything is possible. Miracles are possible. Everything is possible because his spirit is living in us. Our next door neighbours, they're not Christians yet, but they call my wife and I the neighbours from heaven. <laughs> Which is really nice, isn't it? Well, we wouldn't want to be called the neighbours from the other side, would we? <laughs> The lady next door, she had a stroke. And as a consequence of the stroke, she fell into a coma. And she got transferred from our local hospital to a, a big hospital in Oxford. And her daughter came round and spoke to my wife and she said to her, we've just met with the consultants and they've told us that mum is brain dead. And she's on a life support machine for f and we've decided that after five days we're going to switch the machine off. So my wife said, well, look, can we visit your mother before you switch the machine off and she dies? And the daughter said, oh, please, if, if you could visit my mother, uh, we'd be so grateful because my mother was so, was just loved you guys. So great, we're going to go. The only day I could go was the fifth day. 
So fifth day, we have to drive to another city and I'm a little bit irritated because I'm like, oh, she was in the local hospital and now we've got to drive an hour. <laughs> you know, and then you don't know this hospital and you don't know where to park the car and I was a bit irritable. Anyway, we eventually get there and she's in intensive care. We walk in and she's got tubes all over her. So I start speaking to her. Hi, Joyce. I said, it's the neighbours from heaven. <laughs> I said, we've just come to say a prayer with you. And she had tubes. I took her by the hand. I held Killy's hand. Killy held her other hand. And I start speaking to her. I said, now, what we're going to do now, Joyce, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. And when we said your kingdom come, she woke up. It was scary. It was like, So it was pretty scary. <laughs> Killy wet herself. <laughs> we went back. I said to her husband, she woke up. He goes, no, she didn't. I said, she did. He said, no, she didn't. I said, she did. She, he goes, she's brain dead. She didn't wake up. I said, she did. Anyway, it didn't matter. She came home the following week. She's still alive. Look, you see, when you've let Jesus into your heart here, it's like, whoa, 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 you are carrying resurrection fire. Right? Now look, we live in a world of miracle and mystery, okay? Uh, yeah, look, that's the world in which we live in. We don't try and figure it all out. God is God, he's not applying for the job. So, uh, you just gotta trust him. But in the meantime, just be channels of that grace, of that love, of that power to other people. We carry the presence of Jesus. Listen, you are lovable, you are valuable, you are forgivable, and you are capable. And what, you know, if you're going to get the most out of the next 24 hours, it begins with saying, Jesus, I open the door. Yes. Come in. Come in and cleanse me. Set me free from the past. Come in and heal me. For those of us that have already got Jesus in our, in our lives and homes, it might be that we've got to say, Jesus, I know you're already in but I've restricted you. I've restricted you, but I don't want to restrict you anymore. I want you to reign and rule in my life. I want you to be resident and president. I want you to go into every room of my life and be who you want to be, and I want to be a channel of whatever you want me to be. That's where it begins with. It begins with that. So the, I'm going to pray a couple of prayers. Killy, can you come up as well? I'm going to pray a couple of prayers, okay? The first thing we're going to do, okay, is this. If you have never opened the door, open the door tonight. Open the door tonight. Or maybe you did a while ago, but you've kind of got distracted and diverted. Why don't you tonight say, hey, I'm coming home. And in a moment, if you want to open the door for the first time, or you want to reconnect with Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to stand up. 
Now, I'm not asking you to stand up to embarrass you. Honestly, I would not want to do that at all. But I'm asking you to express your desire to do this by expressing it with the whole of your mind and your body and your will. And I want you to stand up here amongst 2,000 people in this amazing building, this amazing church, because if you stand up in here, you'll be able to stand up outside. And when you've stood up, when you stood up, I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you to pray the prayer. And once you've prayed the prayer, Killy's going to say a prayer for you. And then you can sit down. And then after that, we're going to pray for anyone here who is sick to receive healing. Okay, so close your eyes. Don't worry about anybody else here. Have you heard Jesus knocking. If you've never opened the door, but you'd like to open the door tonight, or you'd like to reconnect with Jesus after a time of absence, can you please stand up now? Just stand up, wherever you are here. Please stand. Please. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Let's just encourage those standing. Thank you. Anyone else? Please, don't miss this opportunity. Now, if your friend or your relative has stood up, why don't you just stand up next to them as a way of you saying, hey, I'm standing up with you to support you. Okay, all those of you that are standing, I'm gonna pray a prayer. I'm going to pray this prayer phrase by phrase and I'll pray it once so you know the words. The second time I pray the prayer, please pray the prayer out loud. If you're sitting down and you love Jesus, can you join in with us and reaffirm your own faith and pray this prayer? Here's the prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that you're knocking on my door. Thank you, Jesus, that you are knocking on my door. I open the door of my life now. I open the door of my life now. I know I have done many things wrong. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. I invite you into my life now. I invite you into my life now. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence and your peace and power. Fill me with your presence, your peace and your power. Thank you, Jesus, that I am lovable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am lovable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am valuable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am valuable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am forgivable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am forgivable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am capable. Thank you, Jesus, that I am capable. Thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. Thank you for hearing and answering my prayer. Amen. As you stand, Killy will pray. Lord, I just thank you for each and every lady standing. Lord, thank you that you know their hearts, you know their minds. And Lord, I pray that the prayer that they prayed would just resonate within them and Lord even tonight you would just give them that peace that passes all understanding and Lord I pray that even as they wake up tomorrow morning they will know that you are with them every moment of every day so bless each one of them protect them 
watch over them. And Lord, for all of us standing with them, Lord, may we help them on their journey of faith too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Great. Please be seated. Okay. Now, if you have a health concern of any kind, okay, just put your hand on your heart now. And maybe you, you've got a loved one who's got a health concern and they're not here tonight. Why don't you represent them and put your hand on your heart to represent them. Okay, and we're gonna, Killy's gonna pray a prayer and I'm gonna pray a prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for doctors, nurses, and the medical profession. But Lord, we know there are limitations. And Lord, I pray for each one here today who has a health concern or is concerned about someone that they love. Lord, I pray for your healing presence. Lord, I pray for your healing balm. Lord, I ask that you would be at work. Lord, for those with anxiety, I pray, Lord, that your perfect love would cast out the fear. And Lord, that you would just reveal your love in a greater and deeper way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So for any disease, any infection in your body or those you are representing, we pray now that it would flush out of your bodies. Now, we pray that where there has been any kind of degeneration, we now pray for regeneration. We pray for restoration in body, in mind and spirit. We pray that all pain would be lifted. We speak health, and wholeness and well-being in body, in mind and spirit. Lord, we pray over tonight as we all sleep that your healing balm would just permeate our bodies and that even in this next 24 hours, you would give us a tangible sign of your healing at work. And we pray and we ask this in the name of God, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen, over these next 24 hours, just keep putting your hand on your heart. Like, and that's saying, Jesus, Jesus, hear my prayer, hear my prayer. And just during the worship, over the next 24 hours, just soak in it. Soak in, soak in the worship. Let, let Jesus touch you. And just keep experiencing that you're valuable and lovable and forgivable. And be renewed. You know, our, our prayer is, I hope this first session, already we hope that you've had a faith lift. Just in this first session. And there's loads more, loads more tomorrow. Much, much more. Yeah, we, we've sent over, we've sent over two, two resources that might be of interest to you. Uh, Killy, do you want to say what that is? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, so 10 children were asked, um, uh, you know, what their questions are on sort of God and life. So you've got things from, will my dog go to heaven? Does God sleep? Where's heaven? Uh, great little resource for children, but adults do enjoy it as well. So 32 questions in there, all beautifully illustrated. Uh, you might want to have a look at that. And who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Uh, and I wrote this to explain who he is, what the historical facts are on who is Jesus. How do we know he's the truth? How do we know that he fulfilled the messianic prophecies? How do we know he rose from the dead? So, um, you know, if you want to have a bit more substance to your faith or even to give to somebody, maybe in your family who doesn't yet know Jesus, then maybe that's something that you can consider. It's been a joy. We want to thank Pastor Leslie and Pastor John uh, for inviting two Brits to come over. Um, 
thank you very much.